Okay, so this is more technical, not totally relevant at this point. But there is one more type of finite state machines, and then I'd like to give a few other pointers. Uh, everybody has seen Mealy and more machines at some point. So there is a connection to that that I'd like to make. Um, but one thing that appears in problems is, is the following type of machines. So an electric board. So let's go to example eight. So this is a uh, chess board game, a simplified version. So imagine that you have a chess board which is only having nine squares. So you, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And I'm going to color this blue, blue, or black. And then the other one will be red. So what are the rules of this game? So the rules are from current square, one can move to an adjacent square only so you define adjacent including diagonals yeah if you will but maybe if you're going to go talk about chess board right maybe not right you could move in diagonals Right, exactly. Depends on, on how you start, right? So let's say, let's set up a, a path of the game. So let's say we start with, um, say, start is at the square one. which is black, even though I use blue, it's black in the chessboard and my notes so I don't mess up here. And let's say that the input is V that takes value in black or red. So these are the two possible choices. Okay, so you start you start in one. If you draw or pick V equal to black, you could move somewhere. And if you pick red, you can move somewhere else. Okay. So how is the table here that I have? I have a start and you start at Q equal to one. And suppose that I pick V equal to red. Then what are my options for Q plus? Q plus could be two or four. OK. 
okay? If I start at q equal to 1, and I pick the other possibility, pick b equal to black, where are my possibilities for q? Or, or remain where I am. Yeah? Okay. Now, suppose that you are in 2, right? So you did V red, you pick 2. Now, let's go on to this. If I pick V equal to black, I am in 2, I can go Q plus could be if I am in 2, 1, 3, or 5. And then if you are in 4, just 4, and I pick also black. And I have the other one there, right? The, if I pick red. If I'm in four and I pick black, Q could be. One, five, or seven. And you can see that this branches out and this branches out. And that's probably all we want to get out of this very simple simplify chessboard which might not be the true chess you like to play but maybe a variation of it what's going on what's different from what we've done so far kind of like we've entered or I mean now you'd be you're in one nested loop and you want to find another nested loop and then you find another nested loop but it could also be that you're state kind of going to the, uh, another state when you think of red and black and black and red, but it's a different number each time. So that's yeah. kind of more complexity. Okay, so we could probably see that this will you know kind of explode. Never stop, right? In this little point you just keep doing this over and over. So that's one observation. And you have multiple paths, multiple options, which you have infinitely many paths. So if you were to write a finite state machine of this, it will be infinite. Is it a finite state machine? Well, it's infinite state. Or infinite transitions, right? But finite states. So it's, the number of transitions will be quite, quite large. The paths will be infinite. But it can be a finite state machine. If but it, if, because if each red is an even number, correct black. It's an odd number, so you could use that to your advantage. Correct. You can only have two states at some point. Right. Exactly, but so we agree, finite state machine, infinite transitions possible, infinite paths. But from each particular state, you have more than one arrow. Right? If you were to draw these, you do a circle one, then you need to add arrows to two and four. And from two, you need to add arrows to one, three, and five. You have, inf you have finitely many of these circles, which are the modes, but you have this branching of choices. Yes? To me, that just says you picked your uh, input incorrectly. I'm not just pick a number, you know? So. I'm in one, I can go to one, two, four, or five. Then, you know, you ignore the red and black because they're arbitrary and just move. You move, yeah. So, so the choices here are, the V are deciding what would be your color that you would land on. That's basically what the color is, is doing. Isn't that more of an output? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, 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 basically you need to, realize that what, what I'm trying to model is that you are in, let's say, one, and if the input is red, you can only go to reds, and if the input is black, you can only go to blacks. So that's basically the decision of the user. I want to move to red. 
I want to move to black. And those would be the choices that you have. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that you have non-determinism. The finite state machine that we described earlier and in the previous lecture has a transition function that is a function. In other words, it gives you one value. It's a single value function. You give me Q, you give me V, you give you, I give you the new value of Q. And it's unique. In this case, I have non-determinism. And that's the whole point of this, is that the FSM associated with example 8 is not deterministic since for each state and each input there are more than one possible state after the transition. So how do we define the finite state machine? We need to somewhat capture this property of having more than one, right? So suppose that I give you a set of values, in this case, two and four. You pretty much need to draw one value from that set. You're only allowed to pick one, but you have two options, or you have multiple options. So basically, the transition function now will be a set. You give me Q, 1. You give me the input, red. And the transition function will be a set. And the new value of the mode state of the transition system will be one element from those. OK? So how do we write that down? So a non-deterministic. pure or with conditional statements structures will have a transition map not function that is set value So Q will be, sorry, delta will be from Q across the input. Now it will be mapping to sets, and this double arrow will do that for us, to elements in Q. Is that across? Is that across? Are those two matrices? This is the space of this is the space of uh, states of the machine. This is the space of inputs. So then we can write that Q, the new value, will take elements from this set. So the new value of this, and now I cannot write equality anymore, right? It will be one of the elements of that.
So what does this mean? In example 8, for q equal 1, v we pick was red. We have that delta of 1 comma red is equal to the set. We could either go to 2 or to 4. And it's up to, I should write this here, and it's up to the choice to where you go. So basically, at this point, with input red, you can go to two or four, and this capture that collection of points. So if now you're analyzing or you're simulating this system, you need to make a choice. So you pick an element from this, and then you, let's say you pick the two, and then you go through the branch of the two, and you keep going. Okay? So your Q plus will be an element from that set. And so on. This can be the fine. So this double arrow here indicates that we have delta mapping points to sets that are not trivially a point. The sets may be large, like in this case, two and four. Okay. And for the ones that probably have seen these in different contexts, this object here is a difference not an equation anymore, but an inclusion. Difference inclusion. Okay. Um, is this entire, entire page correct, or is there a number for the example like the cyber-physical system that is... Well, the chessboard uh, game is, is a real-world example. If you want to analyze all the choices that the players have, but in physical system, if you will, imagine that now you have a finite state machine that is picking controllers. Okay? So it's a little more sophisticated than the thermostat. Uh, the finite state machine says, I will use this more advanced algorithm to, to handle this particular situation. Right? So imagine that you hit a condition, your system hits a condition where it doesn't really matter which controller I pick among these two. So under this condition, I'll be happy if either of these two controllers is chosen. And that will correspond to a model that will be non-deterministic. Another situation appears when you have probability. And then you need to pretty much guess, according to probability distributions, which ones are the more likely choices that some system will make or some algorithm will return. It's going from deterministic systems that we were working up to now to non-deterministic. What are the advantages of doing non-deterministic analysis? Is that one of them is that you can capture more possibilities by just expanding the range of your variables and your choices. And as it will become clear next week, you can model things somewhat in a compact fashion using inclusions. It will become a little clear at this point, it becomes a little bit perhaps different than previous stuff, but bear with me, it's useful. Now, what certainly we need to embrace is that, well, there are non-unique paths as in this chessboard game. So trajectories to my system might not be any more, any more unique. So we need to embrace that from an initial condition, the path might be non-unique that you will obtain.
Other you question? develop something for this, you want to have every situation, and you try to simplify it using a couple of different statements, maybe some sort of case, switch cases, where you have to write down every path to solve it. Right. Yeah. So the idea of the tools that I will tell you about as we get more advanced on the material is that you don't need to solve for the system trajectories. So that's the power of control theory to some extent. If you if you design your control algorithm and the plant is linear and the controller generates a closed-loop system that is linear, if you can put the eigenvalues of the resulting matrix A, like in the state space model, on the left half plane, then you guarantee that all trajectories will converge to a particular condition. No matter where you start, and you don't even need to compute those trajectories because you know that all, they all will converge. So what is the power there? By saying something about a matrix, in particular the eigenvalues, you can say something about all possible trajectories. And an example was that z dot or t dot equal minus a t system that we looked at, that we say, well, if a is positive, all the trajectories converge to zero exponentially. If a is negative, you get t dot equal to a number that is positive times t. Every trajectory blows up to infinity. And you don't even need to compute the trajectories to know where things are going to converge. So that's kind of the idea behind the analysis of the matrix or the eigenvalues of the matrix. When you add non-determinism, it would be great to have a tool that allows me to say, no matter which one I pick, two or four, I will win the game. Or no matter which controller I pick from this subset that I can pick at this point, I will stabilize the system. So it turns out that with very little effort, you can write down conditions that even though now you have set valuedness, multiple options, if your conditions hold for all the options, for all the points, instead of for a single point, as before, you will achieve, let's say, a stability or forward invariance or whatever property you want to achieve. So the message is that you augment the possible paths, you make the system or the model non-deterministic, but the good news is that the tools don't change too much from what it would be when you had determinism to what you have now. Certainly, the same analysis will need to be revisited, and hopefully whatever quantity you use to guarantee that behavior would work, and if not, you will need to modify it to pretty much guarantee that in the range of the variability of the values, you have the behavior you want. Let's go back to t dot equal minus at. And let me now say that a belongs to a particular range. It's a variable that I don't know. Can I use the same exponential analysis for every possible point? The answer is yes. All you need to know is what the range is and hopefully have the analysis tool that will allow you to change the parameters. So the analysis of these ranges or how things change with variations that not, is not much different than when you don't have variation. The question is whether you can tolerate that much variation. So we will see some cases where that is true. Any other questions? Okay, so we are running out of time, so maybe I should just wrap up and then leave the next model for next week. So, so, so far, we have seen um, FSM that are pure, these are given by um, Q plus in delta QV, Q 
Q in capital Q, Q in um, V in sigma, V in sigma, and then the output of this was theta, kappa Q. Okay? Then FSM with conditional structures. So to this we add Q plus equal to VQV, theta kappa Q, 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 V in sigma, uh, when L of Q, V, theta less or equal than zero. And then the third one would be FSM with non-deterministic transition function, which now has Q in this QV. The output could also be non-deterministic, and then the rest will correspond to whether you have conditional structures or not. Okay, and then we worked out a preliminary closed loop system involving the physics of the temperature. and a logic-based algorithm model as a FSM with conditional structures. And these are the type of models. So now the question is, what's next? Let me just say before I forget that um, if you don't remember, recall that a FSM terminates if in the context of this class you already have it clear, if there is a steady state that can be induced by inputs. So remember the finite state machine that we have A, B, and C, and if we were to reach C, we wouldn't leave that that uh, 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 state. That means that the machine terminates their normal transitions, okay? And then um, that merely machines are pure FSMs. I think that's probably before I forget. So what what is next? How do we interface physical models? to cyber models. That's what comes next. Okay. And then so this will be what is called interfaces. We're going to also see models of simple computations. and iterative computations and then the idea will be to also model networks so these converters are typically ADC, DAC and the like 
of the networks. Um, in the model of networks, that's where another non-determinism will pop up. The reason is because we want to model digital networks. We want to model the situation where you have a system that transmits information to another system. And that occurs at certain instance. In an ideal world, you would be able to transmit information continuously. That's not possible. In a sub-ideal world, you will be able to transmit information periodically. That's also not possible. So the model that we want to come up with, which should be in a, in a non-ideal world, will actually have the capability of transmitting, let's say, within a window. And I would say, for example, I will guarantee that my transmissions will occur every one second in the fastest case, but in the worst case, they will not, not occur more than every 10 seconds. So you can, you can kind of guess how long it will take in the worst case and in the best case for packets to arrive. And it's a very simple model that is non-deterministic to, to capture that. Simple model that is non-deterministic to capture that. OK? Make sense? That model can also be used for situations like fault tolerant control systems. What you know, typically, in faulty systems, is that faults do not occur too often. But you don't know when the faults occur. Right? So if you can guarantee that within this one second there will be no fault, or there will be no event, if you want to make it generic, then you have what is called a dwell time. You have the guarantee that within one second at least your system will not have events, whatever they are, in particular faults. So those are the type of situations that non-determinism is helpful to model such conditions. So this is our goal for next week. And um, if you have questions, we'll wrap here. I have, I'm meant to show you a little little gift. Let me just um, see if I can show this. So I have this. Do we need to switch? Yeah, yes. Nothing got disconnected. All right. So I have Actually, we have to go that way. Have these two little since we're talking about networks. Okay. So this is again is a stack of um, a RF device that is working on Bluetooth technology. So this little square, and what is below is basically controlling and producing the power to it. There's not much going on in this little board. This can be miniaturized pretty much to the size of this little RF uh, system. And what you see here is a basic algorithm that triggers events on this light. So it will periodically, it's close to a second, um, it will reset a timer and it will blink. Okay? And this wire is just to power this thing because I don't have another battery pack. But what I'm going to do now is to turn this guy on And what these guys are going to try to do is to synchronize their blinking through the network. So there is an algorithm 
that allows them to find each other and every time that one of them flashes it will call the other one and the timer of the one that receives the flash will essentially change slightly and as you see they're getting slowly close to each other. They separate a little bit because of delay but then they resynchronize. Okay? And this is happening between this guy and this guy um, through Bluetooth. And we haven't modeled it, but behind that network there should be uncertainty in how fast or how late the information will come once you put it in the, in the network. And that's a particular model that one could study. And uh, the events are interesting because the timer that triggers the event has a reset, so it's having a transition, if you will. So see they are they're pretty much synchronized. They eventually will become a part and then resynchronize again. Okay. You can think about this with now with motion. So this could be fireflies, right? That now we have a sensor perhaps, and the sensor, not the network, will trigger the update of the internal timer. That's what biologists believe, that when they see a flash, they adjust the internal timers. But this is another of the modules that we have available to do um, experiments. And ideally, this could be extended to multiple. All right, so that's what I have today. Any questions?